Hello everyone, I, I will start in a second. I'm just gonna wait and see if anyone else wants to join first. Um, but yeah, I'll be starting in the next minute or so. Okey doke. Right, I'll just start now then. And if anyone else joins, then they'll have to miss the start. Okay, so today we're going to be going over um, basically just the background about UCAT and a little bit of breakdown about some top tips for each of the different sections. This isn't really like a deep dive into any of the sections in particular, but just an overview of what they're going to include and some top tips to help you with starting your revision um or some of you might have already started but ju just to help you along basically uh i'll cover things like um you know how to book your cat um where you'll be taking it uh those sort of things so to start off with just today's session if you do have any questions at all throughout the session um hopefully you can all hear me and see my screen okay and see the powerpoint i've got up uh, obviously if not pop that in your ch chat box um but if you do have any questions about ucat in general or medical school or anything um feel free to pop them in the q a um and i've got some time at the end of my presentation where i'll answer those for you um but yeah feel free to ask literally anything um and don't worry i have seen that you've put it in there it's just that i'll come to it later um and i'll talk you through the ucat basically um we will be doing some practice questions it's up to you whether you do them or not i'm not going to ask you for your answers um just so you can get a, an understanding of what the questions look like and what kind of thing you'll be doing when you do sit your ucat but if you do want to grab a pen and pen and paper so you can kind of work along with it as well um, feel free to go grab that now and if you miss anything don't worry because six med post these presentations on their youtube so it will be available later um also things that you don't need to take notes throughout the session you can get hold of it uh, another time if you need any of this information okay so a little bit about me my name's ella i'd have forgot to say that before um, I've just completed my medical degree at um, the University of Manchester, which is this lovely uh, building down here. There is the medical school at Manchester. Um, and I'm about to start my first junior do doctor job, my, F my foundation year one job uh, in Carlisle Infirmary. And I'll start that in just under a month. Uh, my main interests are in paediatrics, uh, but I also like emergency medicine as well. Um, so maybe doing something that combines the two in the future. Um, we will see how my first few years of, of junior doctor go uh, before I decide. Um, I've been tutoring with six med for the past uh, five years, and I've done um, works with other charities and outreach projects as well in those times. Um, and in terms of tutoring, my special interests are in communication skills and ethics and law. So especially if you've got any questions about situational judgment, uh, I'm probably the person to ask. I've done most of my university projects on those kind of topics. So. Yeah, feel free to ask anything. Um, and because everyone asks, my UCAT score was somewhere around 2,900 um, all in all, which was the top decile in the year I did it. Um, and back when I sat the UCAT, it used to be called the UK CAT, but it was exactly the same as it is today. So a little bit of background about UCAT. So it's one of the entrance exams and it's the one that's used most commonly by UK medical schools. Um, if you're not sure whether the medical school you're interested in uses UCAT, just have a look on their website. Um, I just thought that would be easier than me including them all on this presentation. Um, usually every med school website or every university website will just have a page on everything you need to do um, to apply there and they'll tell you whether they're UCAT or BMAT or another 
entrance exam. Um, and going forward, pretty much everyone is going to be using UCAT after this year anyway. So um, the UCAT split into five sections um, and in total you get two scores. One is a, a number, which is either a mean or a combined score of um, the first four sections. And then you're also given a band um, score for your situational judgment, which is separate. Um, as soon as you walk out of your exam, um, they will give you a piece of paper with your scores on it. So you do know immediately how, um, how you've scored. And then they will send this score to the universities after you've submitted your UCAS application. Uh, so there's nothing you need to do about that. UCAT themselves will sort that for you. Um, about halfway through the UCAT sitting sort of timeline, uh, they publish a predicted decile. So they look at how well everyone has done so far and they will tell you whether your score has been in sort of the top 10%, 20%, et cetera. Um, and then after everyone sat the UCAT, they predict the official deciles, which do change a little bit. Usually the predicted deciles are a little bit sort of stricter or, or more tight. And then the official deciles tend to sort of drop down. The grade boundaries are more... Um, forgiving, I guess, um, as a general rule, but that'll help you decide sort of how well you've done with the UCAT and whether or not, you you know, some of you might be considering sitting BMAT if your UCAT didn't go so well, um, so they can help you sort of decide. Um, and different universities will look at UCAT differently, so look on their websites and they should explain it to you. Some use a cutoff sort of system where they say we'll look at the top um 30 percent of of UCAT scores and um, we'll take those applicants others will kind of look at it more holistically alongside um other criteria so uh yeah and if it's not on their websites you can email the admin teams and they should explain to you how they look at UCAT um also a lot of universities will release data on the applicants they took for the past few years so if you want to see um what the kind of average UCAT score of your previous applicants were that should all be available on their websites as well um, in general, anything over 700 in a any UCAT section is seen as a very, very competitive score, um, but you should really be aiming for over 650 in each section. Um, and usually for situational judgment, as long as you don't get banned for, you should be OK. Uh, you do have to pay to sit the UCAT. It's £70 if you're um, a UK citizen. And 140 pounds if you're international. Um, if you're struggling to pay the, for the UCAT, there are bursaries available and they're explained on the UCAT website. So you just type in UCAT bursaries and you should be able to get some help with that. Um, so up here in the top corner, we've got what it looked like when you go to sit your UCAT, you'll be in little booths on a computer in your local centre. Uh, you book the test through their website. Um, I hope if you're sitting it this year, you've already kind of registered with UCAT. I'm pretty sure it's open at the moment. Um, and then you should be able to choose a test to book. Um, and a lot of different people ask me what dates are the best, like what date is best to the UCAT. I know some people prefer earlier in the summer, some people prefer later. My general rule is just do whatever you feel better with. Um, but if you're sitting BMAT, you might choose to sit UCAT a bit earlier. So you've got more time to revise BMAT, um, but it really doesn't make that much difference. Um, so, you know, kind of do what you want to do, basically. Um, but you will sit it over the summer before you submit a UCAS application. Um, it, an important point is that your score is only applicable for the application of the same year. So if you're applying this year, you sit UCAT this year. If you don't get into medical school this year, you will have to reset the UCAT for next year. Um, it's only uh, applicable for one cycle. Um, so just be aware of that, I guess. If you have any special needs or mitigating circumstances, things like um, if you're given extra time in your A-levels um, or IB, then you might be eligible for some extra time in the UCAT as well. I would really urge you to go and apply for mitigating circumstances through their website if that is the case because UCAT is a really heavily time exam it's not that difficult but the timing um, is where a lot of people trip up so if you do think you need extra time for any reason please do apply for it, it is there and um, it probably will be very helpful yeah and it'll be sat at your local Pearson View test centre same place you'll sit your driving theory tests in the UK um, if you choose to learn to drive 
Um, and you will be given a pen and a paper or a pen and a whiteboard at the centre. You're not allowed to bring in your own um, paper and pens. Um, and you're also not allowed to bring in your own calculator. There is a little calculator at the top of the UCAT screen and you can use that on screen calculator. But yeah, you won't be allowed to bring anything in with you um, to the actual exam room. So just be aware of that when you're revising your UCAT, just practice using an on screen calculator and, and typing quickly because that actually does really slow people down. And people who've practiced with an in hand calculator tend to struggle a little bit if they haven't practiced. So general top tips for UCAT, loads of practice questions. It's really the only way you can get better because the UCAT does test kind of strange um, aspects of kind of intelligence. So it's not something where you can just sit down with a book and read up about it. You do need to practice the questions. Um, I really do urge you to use the UCAT's own question banks as well as, um, you know, an online or in book one that you might have as well because they will give you a really realistic version of what you will have in your actual exam, um, as well as you being able to get used to the layout of the exam on, on a computer screen. So yeah, they have quite a lot of questions now on there. And um, so you should definitely check it out. Um, in terms of like how to revise, I recommend starting off practicing your technique on all the different um, types of questions. So find a question bank and just see if you can work through all the questions, um, practice getting them right, but not worrying too much about timing. And then as you start to get the hang of them, then be a bit stricter on timing and see if you can get yourself within the recommended time for each of the questions. Um, but if you start off only giving yourself a couple of seconds per question, you'll just never be able to improve your technique. So try that. Um, again, a lot of people ask me how long they should be revising for the UCAT. I started at the start of the summer um, that I sat my UCAT and I sat the UCAT right at the end of the summer. So it was probably a, a few weeks, a month or so. Um, but I just did about 30 minutes a day, every day. Um, and that worked for me. I, I wouldn't recommend cramming for the UCAT. I don't think it's that successful. It won't stick in your head at all. Um, if you get a question bank and you can have it on your phone, it could be something where if you're sitting around in a waiting room or you've gone to see your friends and you're just in the car on the way there, you could have a little, um, do like three or four questions then. Um, that kind of thing I think is good. Yeah, make sure you practice with the software um, or on a computer with the UCAT questions so that you are familiar with them before you go in. Um, and this might sound a bit counterintuitive, but don't get overly stressed with concepts and techniques in the exam. Um, especially true of abstract reasoning. I remember trying to memorize all the different types of patterns that can come up. Um, and I sat in my exam and I just didn't have any time to think about those at all um, and actually worked quite a lot off gut instinct. Um, but as long as you've done those practice questions, your instinct will be pretty good with them. So yeah, don't get overly focused on concepts and technique, just practice questions, practice, 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 and you'll be okay. This is a bit of a timeline of um, what happens at the UCAT. So yeah, the UCAT accounts are open um, and booking has also opened. So some of you might already know when your tests are. Um, and then, yeah, there's quite a long time of which the testing dates are open. And then you will basically sit your exam. You'll then submit your UCAS application to choose which medical schools to apply for. Um, and yeah, then they will set, then UCAT will send over your scores to them um, after that point. So as I mentioned before, the UCAT split into five sections, um, verbal reasoning, so basically comprehensions, uh, decision-making, which tests your logic um, and decision-making, obviously, uh, quantitative reasoning, which is basically the maths section, Abstract reasoning, which is your pattern recognition section, and then situational judgment, which tests your professionalism, basically. So a bit of a breakdown. Um, you'll start on the verbal reasoning and it goes in this order. It will, the exam moves on after the time you're given for each of the sections. You don't have a combined time where you can spend more time on one section. Um, if you find it particularly difficult at the end of verbal reasoning, you'll move on and you won't be able to edit your answers anymore. So 
verbal reasoning is where you begin and you have 44 questions, 21 minutes. Um, those questions are broken down into different passages, sort of comprehension passages. And you'll be asked multiple questions on each passage. So there's not 44 things you need to read. Um, it'll, there's usually sort of four questions to a passage. Um, and so when you look at sort of seconds per question, what that really is, is for the first question, you might spend a bit more time going through the passage and then the subsequent questions will go a bit quicker. Um, and I'll just give you a moment to read through the rest of them. I'm not going to read all the numbers out, um, but I will sort of draw your attention to the fact that abstract reasoning is very, very short with a lot of questions. And that's what I mean by it's quite difficult to sit there with your list of all the different patterns and figure out what the pattern is. Um, in terms of the scores, just so you're aware, I mentioned about situational judgment with the bands, band one being the best, band four being the worst. Um, the others are scored out of 900. Um, most people will get pretty much between 600 and 800 in each. Um, but yeah, the lowest score you can get is 300, highest is 900. Uh, da, 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 da. So starting on verbal reasoning, um, I know a lot of people don't really understand the point of the UCAT um, in terms of like, what does it test? What does it actually tell the medical school? Um, it is actually pretty applicable to life as a doctor and life as, as a medical student once you hit the wards. Um, verbal reasoning, the reason why they test this is as a doctor, you have to be able to read things really quickly. And if you're called in the middle of the night to see a patient, you have never met this patient, you're going to need to read the notes pretty quickly and be able to come up up with some logical conclusions based on those notes. And that's why we have verbal reasoning um, within the UCAT. Um, so it assesses your ability to read and consider information presented. Um, yes, there you go, I mentioned that before. Each passage has roughly four associated questions. Some of the passages can be really, really long. So please practice your speed reading before your UCAT. It doesn't matter what you speed read, but just get used to reading books, get used to reading, um, newspaper articles, whatever it is you want to do, but just practice being able to skim read, read quickly. Uh, da, 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 da. So what I've kind of put here is each of the different sections, there are different question types within each. I wouldn't worry too much about the different question types, but um, just be aware that there will be slightly different layout for each of the questions. They'll ask you slightly different things. Um, so make sure you read the question and um, are actually answering what they want you to answer. Um, and in verbal reasoning, there's only one correct answer. If you get it right, you'll get a point. If you don't get it right, there's no negative marking, but there's also no partial marking in verbal reasoning. You don't get half marks, basically. So in terms of top tips for um, verbal reasoning, Make sure you don't use your own knowledge and try not to make assumptions um, without backup from the text. So if they have um, an article on penguins and you're a penguin expert, if they ask you a question and you know it's true in real life, but the, that answer can't be found within the passage, then you have to mark that as sort of incorrect or not available information in the passage. Um, don't, just because it's right in real life, assume that you're going to get the mark for answering that in the UCAT. It's much more about looking at what the passage says, basing off that. Yeah, practice speed reading. Yeah, useful in general in medicine, useful for medicine in general. Um, when you get to being on the wards, you're going to be expected to write, type, and read really quickly. So just a, a general good thing to be good at. Um, different people have different techniques. Some people would rather read the questions and see what they need, what information they need to get from the passage first. Other people would rather skim read the passage than go to the questions. Uh, practice both and just see which one you prefer. Um, me personally, I like to skim read the passage really quickly, look at the questions and then go back and find that information. That's what works for me. It doesn't work for everyone. So try different ways and see what is quickest for you and what is most accurate for you, basically. Um, but whichever way you choose, just try and have a system so that when you go into UCAT, you're just straight away doing something basically. Don't just sit around and kind of panic. And if you're really stuck, eliminate obvious incorrect answers. You're increasing your chance of getting a mark by doing that. 
So practice question first, I'll just give you 30 seconds to have a read through and think about what your answer for this one would be. Don't bother putting your answers in the chat. That's absolutely fine. You can just have them for yourself. Um, but yeah, I'll give you 30 seconds just to have a quick read and see what, what you think this answer would be. Just so you're aware, these practice questions that I've got came from UCAT question banks on their website. So these are pretty accurate to the kind of thing you will get in your real exam. Um, okay, I'll show you the answer now. Um, well, I'll give you a moment just to read through their reasoning. The UCAT question banks are pretty good because they do explain the answers for each of the questions. So, um, it hopefully should make sense. What you'll notice from this question as well is the passage is really long and that is pretty standard for UCAT. Um, you're not just going to be given a small paragraph, hence why speed reading is so important. Um, as you're just reading through those, I would just will point out some of the points in there that are really important. So for example, with the reason B can't be correct is because they don't have strong enough evidence. Um, that is pretty standard reasoning from UCAT. Um, think about what in science in general you would be deemed to be sort of strong evidence um, or you know enough evidence to make a reasonable assumption from. And you'll notice in C that it says that there's no reference within the passage to first time offenders. So that's, again, um, just making sure that whatever you think the correct answer is can be backed up by the passage. Hopefully that'll make sense. Um, if you do have any questions about um, verbal reasoning, just sit in the chat. Decision making. So decision making is um, a relatively new um, section of the UK, and I think it was introduced just before I sat my UK cat. Um, and so if you do look at getting question banks online, pretty sure the online one should all be pretty up to date. If you buy a book, a, U, a UCAT book or a UK cat book, they will have the same sort of questions and they will be like really good to use, but they might just like leave out decision making. So just be aware of that. Uh, the reason decision making is important should be pretty obvious. You need to be able to make logical conclusions and evaluate arguments when you're a doctor. Um, but you don't really need to know anything for decision making. It really is just pure logic. Um, and you can get lots of different questions that might refer to text, diagrams, or graphs. And in decision making, you can get full marks and also half marks, depending on what you answer. And again, no negative marking. So top tips for decision making. Again, similarly to verbal reasoning, you need to suspend your own logic and beliefs. So just because, I mean, especially in decision making actually, because this is where you'll see really obvious um, texts and you'll be thinking, oh, it says a blackbird is a bird. That's obviously true. But if it doesn't say that in the text, you can't put that it is true. Um, because you can't like logically come to that conclusion from the evidence that they've given you. So make sure you're just focusing on what the text says and not what you believe yourself. Um, for some of you, so for example, me, I didn't sit A-level uh, maths. You might just want to brush up on some basic maths and like statistics if it's been a while since you've read off a bar chart or a pie chart. 
Um, again, read questions really carefully and focus on what they're asking you. Focus on the language they've used. If they've said only this can happen when this happens, that only is quite an important word and might change um, sort of the logical conclusions that would come from the passage. You'll understand that more as you do more practice questions, but the very specific words they use are very important. So only versus some, um, always, those kind of words um, will very much change what the answer is. Um, you might be like me, where if you're struggling to come to logical conclusions, you need to write things down, write down a flow chart, um, create your own diagrams to help you visualize the conclusion and the concepts. That's absolutely fine. Obviously, you're, you have your whiteboard in your exam, so you can do that. Um, I personally really recommend that because as soon as you've got that information laid out in a way that you can understand, you'll be able to answer the questions a lot quicker. What is that? Um, in any of the maths kind of questions in UCAT, I would consider rounding the numbers. It's a multiple choice exam. And if the answers are all very different from each other, then rounding numbers actually might help you get to the answer pretty quickly. Um, and revise probability as a concept. A lot of students find probability tricky and UCAT love probability questions in multiple of the different sections. So definitely revise how to calculate probability. Okay, I'll give you uh, like 30 seconds to read through this question. This is like a really standard, fairly easy um, decision making question um, where you're given a very short passage and then you're just asked to make a few different conclusions based off the passage. Um, hopefully you guys will find this one not too difficult, but I think it just explains the concept of decision making pretty well. And for the person on the Q&A who's asked if the PowerPoint will be um, available to view later, Six Med will post this webinar, I think on their YouTube, you might be able to find a link through their website. Um, so yes, you will be able to re-look at these slides. I think sometimes they do publish the PowerPoint as well. Um, if you're struggling to access them or you can't find them, uh, the UCAT team have an email address, I think it's team at at uh, six med um but that you'll be able to find that on the um their website as well uh, so you can drop them a message if you're struggling to find the recordings okay i reckon that's about 30 seconds i'm sorry if if i'm not giving you guys enough time um i read through things pretty quickly um i'll give you a, a couple of seconds to read through the answers as well um, but hopefully that was all pretty self-explanatory. I know most people have gone through this question with don't struggle too much with it. Um, but here you can see as well um, the importance of vocab. So like the first point, the first conclusion says none of the boys are awake. The third one says all of the girls are awake. Paying attention to those um, quantifiers will um, change what logical conclusions you can make. So just be very careful with, with what they say. And again, you'll notice that the absence of information in the text um, kind of determines the answers to multiple of those conclusions. Okay, hopefully you read through all of those. Like I said earlier, all of these questions are in the UCAT um, question bank, so you can actually go and find them there as well. Um, this is another practice question that, that kind of set out a little bit differently from the previous one. I'll give you 30 seconds to read this one, see what you think. Then this is a little bit more of a tricky question, so that's why I include it. Um, but it does make sense when you read their reasoning.
Um, so for the previous question, just to answer the questions that were in the in the Q&A, so someone's asked about would you have got half marks for that question or how many marks would you get for that question? I can't quite remember for sure, but I'm pretty certain that each of the conclusions themselves was a mark. That last one. For this question that's up on the screen, this is the kind of question where you, you would get um, half marks. You'll notice that there's two yes and two no. So it's these kind of questions where if there's two yeses and the answers are yes, but you've chosen the wrong reason, there potentially could be a half mark there. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to read through them and have a little think. Um, this is their reasoning for why the correct answer would be A. You'll notice that this the reason this question is so difficult is because the reason why B, C, and D are wrong is because um, they're all based on assumptions that can't very strongly be backed up by the text. Um, so kind of reasons for things not being uh, properly backed up and, uh, you know, kind of like an assumption would be things like not including like strong statistics or if the sample size wasn't very big um, or if it's saying something about, um, let's say, um, a country that the passage hasn't spoken about. So let's say if it talked about developing countries, but it's if the passage itself had talked about its impact in developed countries, um, that would be like an assumption. So those kind of reasons are quite common. Um, I hope that makes sense. I know some people struggle a little bit with this question, but it's basically just seeing what could be the most backed up by the evidence you were given. Um, and the more questions you do, the more the answers will become like obvious. You'll understand what UCAT are wanting you to do. I remember a teacher once telling me when I was in sixth form that when you do like sixth form questions or, or like sixth form exams or like UCAT exams, they are really like just wanting you to play their game and they have a reason and they want you to just go with that reason and base your answers on that. So the more questions you do, the more you'll see, oh, that's what you cat wants me to, to say, basically. So hopefully that all made sense. If you've got any questions about decision-making, pop them in the chat. Quantitative reasoning is what most of you will find the easiest section. As I mentioned before, I didn't do A-level maths, but I also find it the easiest section. Um, I scored eight and eight, 190 in my um, quantitative reasoning and it basically just as assesses your basic use of maths um, which is important when you're a doctor because you will be doing drug calculations etc um, and it just assumes that you have um, this is from the UCAT website they assume familiarity with numbers um, to the standard of a good grade at GCSE. So to get into medicine, you'll need to be an A or an A star in GCSE maths anyway. So they assume that you got that and that's kind of the standard they're going off. You won't be asked to do anything that difficult. It pretty much is just addition, subtraction, um, multiplication, division, and then like reading off graphs and things, that kind of stuff. Probability percentages as well. Um, yeah, and then you'll be given a set of data, sort of similar to those past couple of um, topics, and then you'll just be asked a few questions on that data set. Um, and you also might have to read off charts and tables. Um, so focus on the questions. So with this one, I actually would recommend reading the question first, because in the quantitative reasoning, they give you these massive tables and massive graphs where you really only need to look at like three of the boxes from the table um it's just like they give you all of this irrelevant data trying to throw you off and waste your time so 
you read the question and figure out what you need to do and what you need first and don't feel like you're going wrong if you're thinking oh my god I've not used most of this table um try and think about what exa exactly they're asking um read the question really carefully be careful about conversions be careful about units if they've got if they ask you how many hours did this take and the questions in minutes make sure you're converting don't get thrown off by that oh these are the topics that come up quite a lot so percentages ratios rates averages um mental arithmetic so things like um just basic addition subtraction multiplications etc um so they're the thing that come those are the things that come up often so if you know you're very weak on one of those particular things please revise them Make sure you practice with your on-screen calculator because you won't be able to use your handheld one. Um, practice things like as well using your keypad to type in on the calculator instead of like clicking with your mouse um, just to improve your speed. Oh, and estimate loads. I know for some of you this will be really difficult because people who go into medicine tend to be like perfectionists um, and it might make you uncomfortable to not actually do the math properly but using estimates and rounding will really help you be a lot quicker. So um, please do use them. This is a practice question. I don't think it'll be too difficult for you, but I will let you just read through it for 30 seconds. Okay, <clears throat> there's your answer and there's the calculation explanation. Um, hopefully this one's, I mean, if you didn't manage to finish it or you didn't get it right, I hope the explanation kind of just makes you realize, oh yeah, that's the right answer because it, it's just it's just maths. It's no sort of, um, I don't know, weird reasonings that you can find in the other sections. Like I said, most of you will find this section goes okay. Um, traditionally, though, when people are revising, they tend to find this section hard. I don't know why, but a lot of people will say that their scores and the real thing in the math section are, are much better than their revision sessions. So um, you can bear that in mind as well. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to have a quick read and that all makes sense. Abstract reasoning. This is what most people dread the most. And I can understand why I hated abstract reasoning back when I sat my UK cap. Um, it assesses the ability to identify patterns among abstract shapes. Um, in medicine, you have to be able to identify patterns and make links um, through like when your patient comes in and gives you a load of abstract symptoms, being able to put that information together and figure out what's going on. Um, that's what abstract reasoning, the, the process is, is meant to uh, represent. So most questions will present you with a set of shapes and ask you to identify the pattern among them. And they will then ask you to sort other shapes into your um, question sets. Um, but then, yeah, different question types will do ask you to do different things with this information. So sometimes you'll be given two sets of shapes and asked where does this shape fit within the sets? 
Others will give you a pattern or a sequence and ask you which is the next shape in the sequence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and similarly to the other sections, each set that you're given, each data set um, applies to multiple questions. This is very, very time pressured. And in the real thing, it will go by so quickly. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing if in your practice, you just try and see if you can identify patterns and take the time that you need and then practice time pressured um, because then you'll just get better at pattern recognition and even just like using your gut instinct to be like, this feels like it fits within this section. Um, that will improve by doing that. So while I've said you probably won't be able to use these possible rules in your real exam, I have included them because for some people, uh, they find that they do help. Um, so shape, so thinking about how many of each shape are in each box, it, uh, da, 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 arrangement. Think about where arrows are pointing in particular. Um, they love to have questions where arrows are pointing at squares at all points, or they're always pointing at a side of the box, or, you know, think about where they're pointing. Um, and think about symmetry, that again comes up quite a lot. Rotation, very, very common, especially in the sequence questions. So when they give you a sequence and ask what the next shape of the sequence is, quite often there's a shape that's rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, so because of that one. Uh, so number, so again, how many of each shape are in the box? Is it always an odd number? Is it always an even number? Um, do the number of shapes or sides or whatever change based on something else? So for example, if the shape is always black, does it have more sides? Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, what does color do to the pattern? Uh, intersection, so do arrows always cut through a straight line? Um, is there sort of three points of each shape that intersect with another shape, et cetera? Um, again, are shapes touching each other? Are they touching the outside of the box? Um, and then enclosure, so are there shapes within other shapes and how do they relate to each other? So for example, if there's a shape inside a white shape, will that shape always be black, for example? And how does that change when things change? So if there's a square on the outside, is there always an upside down star inside? Um, but if it's a circle on the outside, the star's the correct way up, that kind of idea. Um, so top tips, similarly to quantitative reasoning, they like to give you extra data and patterns that will throw you off. So try and focus on what you need to focus on. They love to just put random extra shapes in each set that have no um, relation to the patterns, just to make it more complicated. Trust your gut instinct. I, I know a lot of people are really scared to do this, but when you become a doctor, you will have to do this as well. Sometimes you've got a patient whose um, saturations, whose presentation is absolutely fine, but you just have an instinct that something's going wrong. Quite often your instinct is, is right, so don't be scared to trust your instinct. Um, be aware of the timing. It's actually a lot better to guess on every question than focus on half the questions and get them right because you've worked out the pattern, but then you've left half the questions unanswered. Um, yeah, if, if you don't see the pattern quickly, then just use your instinct and move on. Um, and start with the simplest box with the fewest number of shapes um, because every box will follow the pattern and um, that box is most likely to have the least sort of extra information that's there to throw you off. So this is an example of like the most common sort of question layout. I chose this one because it's really simple. Um, I hope all of you can see what the pattern is here. Um, but just so you can get an idea of how they'll ask these questions, you'll see they've given you two sets of shapes and each of the sets follows a rule. And quite often these two sets, the rule will be different, but will kind of be similar. So. I hope you've all seen that set A, um, the symmetry there, but it's running through um, sort of horizontally through the box. Whereas in set B, the symmetry is running vertically through the boxes. So you can see they're kind of like similar rules, but they're different. 
um, and then you can see that the test shape is then given. And um, um, and yeah, you'll just then choose which set it, it falls under. So hopefully that one was simple. I'll show you this one. This one's a little bit more difficult. Um, I'll be honest, you'd be very, very lucky to get that pattern in your actual UCAT. It's you're much more likely to get a much more complicated waffly rule pattern, more similar to this one. Um, I'll give you 30 seconds to have a think about this one. Um, but yeah, this is much more sort of standard. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to read through that. And there's the, the rule if you want to have a read through. You can see this is, is the sort of clockwise versus anti-clockwise um, question. This is like very, very typical of, of the UCAT pattern you'll be given. You'll notice as well, the patterns tend to be sort of multi-layered in that there's very rarely just like one rule, but there's multiple sort of interlinking rules. Okay. Hopefully you've had a chance to read that and that all makes sense. Any questions, pop them in the chat. And finally, situational judgment. Um, my favorite one. So situational judgment assesses your capacity to understand real life situations and test how you will act in a professional manner in those situations. Quite often they'll put you in the point of view of a medical student doing something on the ward on your placement at a medical school. And they'll say something happens, how would you react basically? And um, it's testing professionalism more than ethics. You're not really expected to know any of the ethical ideas that like you won't be asked about the ethical pillars, for example, um, just thinking about how to act professionally in those situations. Just so you're aware that SJTs or situational judgment tests make up quite a large amount of testing throughout your medical career. Um, currently, or what I sat before finishing medical school, I sat a big, quite difficult SJT, um, which helped decide where we would go for um, our foundation programs as a junior doctor. They are phasing that out now. So by the time that you guys get to the end of medical school, it's unlikely you'll have to sit one. But currently, this is still you know, the SJTs, if you want to go into certain specialties. So this is likely going to come up again at some point in your life. The kind of skills that they want you to be aware of um, are perspective taking. So that just means thinking about how everyone in the situation feels, um, trying to understand why people do certain things and how to sort of act accordingly. Integrity, very important. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Team involvement, so what the, the roles of everyone in the team, what's appropriate to expect of different people. Um, resilience is obvious and adaptability. 
So typically you'll be given a hypothetical scenario and then you'll be asked to evaluate a set of responses. Usually you'll be given a couple of responses for each scenario and they'll either ask how important something is to consider within deciding what your action is going to be or how appropriate each of the actions are. Just pay attention, read the question and make sure you know which of the two um, they are because that might change your approach slightly. Uh, yeah, each scenario has up to six associated questions. You don't need to have any medical knowledge. You won't be asked um, or expected to know anything about medicine. Um, in your later SJTs, you will, but you guys won't be expected. Um, you should maybe just have a general idea of what could be expected of a medical student. So for example, it should be obvious to you that if the question is asking, sort of, there's a registrar, they've been called to see a page, patient urgently and they've asked you as the medical student to take over consenting a procedure or doing a procedure that's outside what you'd expect a medical student to be able to do. So for example, you know, a surgery or something, then um, they might expect you to know that, but they won't really expect you to know anything more than that. And in situational judgment, you get half marks as well if you get sort of close to the real answer. So top tips. Read the question really carefully. Understand what's being asked of you. Pay attention to the language again, because very slight changes in the language um, will change what the response is. Um, think, put yourself in the shoes of the person in the scenario. So if they're a medical student, put yourself in that person's shoes. Are they a nurse? Are they a doctor? Are they a patient? What is it? Um, judge each answer individually. So as I said, you'll be given a scenario and then you'll give will be given multiple responses um, think about how appropriate each of the individual responses are don't assume because it's asked if you do something else that you're doing that as well as the current thing they're asking think of each separate thing as a thing on their own um, but also be aware that if it says how important is this while making your decision they're not saying only think of that when you're making your decision just what part of the decision making process will it play um oh yeah just because something doesn't kind of cover everything you would feel you needed to do in the scenario doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong so let's say there's a situation where a doctor or a nurse has done something that could harm patient safety and the response it gives you is how appropriate would it be to sort of intervene and stop what was going on don't assume that that doesn't mean you'd also report the incident, for example, or talk to someone about the incident. Mm, oh, and yeah, if you have one hypothetical scenario and you find that all of the questions that are being asked on that scenario, you're putting very appropriate, that very well might be right. You can't do that all the time. It's just because you're putting the same answer for multiple different things, it's not that you're wrong it just might be that they're all very appropriate things to do in real life when things go wrong or when things happen that you wouldn't expect them to happen um there are usually quite a lot of different things that you need to do to add to sort of um address that situation um i'm sure none of you would do this but make sure you set aside your own beliefs and bias if it's talking about something like abortion for example um try and think from what the GMC tell us to, to do in these situations, not just if you believe something, it doesn't necessarily mean you're right. Um, the GMC have this document called Good Medical Practice. It's kind of long, it's quite boring to read. Um, the situational judgment test basically is based on the ideas within that document. Um, and so you might find it useful to read or skim read through that document. Some in some universities will ask you to do this before interview anyway, so it might be inevitable for some of you, but um, you could potentially read it if you want to. There's another document called Tomorrow's Doctors, which is also a GMC document. I think it's got a different name now, but um, if you type in Tomorrow's Doctors, it will come up. And that explains like what a medical student could be expected to do on the wards. So if you're finding that you're constantly getting questions wrong because you're acting outside competency and you want to read up a bit more about that, then tomorrow's doctors is something that can give you like a bit of advice. So these are just like some ideas um, that you should just be aware of. Um, 
always like listen and be respectful um everyone's views in every situation should always be considered so if the patient doesn't want to do something but you think it's the right thing to do like listen to the patient and um think about why they're saying what they're saying that's true this by the way is true of interviews and also in your medical career um working collaboratively and respectfully is important so never undermine colleagues so in the SJT this quite often comes up with like um not wanting to interrupt a colleague talking to a patient because that would undermine that colleague and damage what that patient thinks of that colleague so they're thinking like why has someone had to get involved should I not trust this doctor for example so try not to undermine colleagues very importantly, integrity is the most important thing, one of the most important things. Dishonest behaviour will always be very inappropriate. Um, and that is very much the case in all of medicine, in interviews, everything. Um, it is absolutely the case in real life that if you did something really bad, for example, you were getting drunk and then, you know, doing surgeries while under the influence of alcohol, if you're then honest about um, it to the GMC and you get help, they will actually not strike you off for that, um, providing obviously nothing too bad has happened and you have got the appropriate help. So being honest is always seen as important. Um, you should be open to receiving feedback, whether that's positive or negative. It's a very normal part of being a medical student and doctor. You're constantly learning. So in the SJT, um, you should always let people know why what they've done wrong is wrong. Um, you should always try and approach them first as well. So you'd never really like just, um, you never just report them to the GMC, for example. You would talk to them and say, do you understand why what you've done is wrong? Um, and try and encourage them to go and not report themselves, but try and go and get help from those, those bodies. Um, yeah, but they should be able to understand why what is wrong is wrong um, first. Uh, yeah, like I've already mentioned, you need to know what your own limitations are um, and when it's when you need to get support. Um, and then the only thing like more important than just like integrity is patient safety. So any question where patient safety is, is at risk, then any answer which helps protect the patient's safety will always be very appropriate. You're also expected to consider public view of the profession. Um, so for example, not like being rude about other doctors where patients can hear you because then they might get like a worse view of doctors. And just be aware of what confidentiality is, when we have to maintain it, um, when it's appropriate to break confidentiality as well. This is an example practice question that I will let you have a quick read through. So we've had a chance to read through that. 
uh, da, da, da. the answer is very important here. So um, for any of you who have done a bit of reading about medical ethics, um, it might be a little bit early now, now, but some of you might have done some. Um, there's a concept called autonomy. And in the UK in particular, autonomy is very, very important. And that just basically means that patients are able to make their own decisions about their health, um, even on wise decisions, providing they have capacity. And in here in the NHS, in the UK, um, autonomy is also very, very important. So um, hopefully that one makes sense. Here's another one, um, we have a quick read through. So the answer to this one's appropriate but not ideal. So um the reason why this one's appropriate but not ideal is because as you hopefully are aware, not noticing that a patient has an allergy is um going to put patient safety at risk, obviously. Um, and so something does need to be done quite quickly in this scenario. It's not ideal because it potentially like affects the patient-doctor relationship or what the patient thinks of that doctor. Um, it's sort of slightly undermining um, the doctor. Um, so hopefully that will make sense. And this is the last question. This is kind of a slightly different layout. So I thought I'd just include it as well. I'll give you 30 seconds to have a read. Okay, hopefully that's enough time. So for this one, the most appropriate response would be to ask the patient if they can re-examine the abdomen together um, because they don't know which one of them is correct or not. Um, and obviously providing the patient agrees, then they could re-examine the abdomen and see if one of them changes their mind. Um, if the question, I know some people struggle a little bit with this question. If it was worded a bit differently and the patient was in like lots of pain, didn't want the students to re-examine them, then the appropriate response would have been to get a senior doctor. But at this point, they could just re-examine this, this patient's abdomen and, and get the right answer. And then obviously least appropriate would be to tell the patient that the other medical student has just examined incorrectly. Um, because they actually, at this point, don't know which one of them is right and which one of them is wrong. Um, so not only does it undermine the other colleague and maybe affect what the patient thinks about medical students, um, it just like, it's not acting with integrity because it's, it's not actually the correct, it's not even correct information. Hopefully that made sense. So extra resources for you. Um, 
so six med offers like the ucat ninja which is um basically lots of practice questions uh six men also do two-day ucat um crash course uh where there's a tutor who can go into a lot more depth in each of the sections um with you and they'll go through like lots of practice questions you can also get some one-to-one -one tuition if you want to go through some questions um with a tutor because you're struggling to understand um all three of these things you can just find um, on the six med website so um, you can kind of read up a bit more about them and, and see if it's something you're interested in also there will be more surgeries um, like webinars today um, going into a slightly more deeper dive into each of the different sections um, and more practice questions um, and then the UCAT website I've mentioned it so many times they have advice from past students um, they a lot of like my um, advice today has come from the UCAT um, they have mock papers and they have practice questions and this is um, a coupon for six med if you want um, five percent off any of the six med products um, I'll just leave that up for a second in case any of you do want to take that coupon code down Also, I am going to stay around for a few minutes to answer some questions. So any questions that you have now, um, pop them in the chat and I will answer them. Okay, okay. Um, I will just X, I will just stop sharing my screen and then you can see my face. Right, so, um, So, okay, calculator on screen um, in the UCAT shortcuts. So there are a few different things you can do. So the first thing you can do is obviously the UCAT sat on a proper computer. So on proper computer keypads, there's obviously that um, the numbers are on the right hand side as well as at the top of the keyboard. Um, get used to using the numbers down the side because it's much quicker to type with those than it is the ones at the top of your keyboard. Um, trying to think what else don't use the calculator for everything if it's something that you can do mentally do that um, keep using rounding I guess um, just practice on the UCAT website with their little on screen calculator because that's exactly the same one you'll use in the real thing and then you'll just start getting the hang of it a bit more um, but yeah definitely use your keyboard and your like, keypad instead of using the mouse to like click on each of the numbers individually because that'll just take forever uh where do we find the gmcs oh i didn't really explain this <laughs> i kind of forgot you guys might not know what the gmc is the gmc is the general medical council which is the governing body of doctors in the uk currently and they just publish loads of advice about um how doctors should act in the UK basically. Um, if you search in Google um, GMC good medical practice then it will just come up there'll just be a document and you'll be able to just click on it. Similarly just type in GMC um, tomorrow's doctors and you'll find that document. Um, I've not been on their website in some time so I don't know how easy it is to find it if you just go to the home page but it's just easy to type in the name of the document and it should come up. Um, what do you suggest besides reflection for someone who's stuck on the same score for each section? Um, so continue just doing little and often. Um, make sure you are thinking about technique um, it, and don't make yourself too time pressured if you're feeling like you're not developing in terms of technique. Um, develop how you're approaching the questions and then go back to timing yourself again. Um, that can help and um after a certain point of your re revision you will find that you kind of hit a bit of a plateau um that's okay just keep revising and try not to get disheartened because every question you do the better chance of you doing well in your real thing um so yeah don't get disheartened too much by the score um i'm trying to think if there's anything else you can do um, maybe if you're just using one um, question bank, think about looking at a different question bank um, because it might be the case that the questions within that question bank are all really similar. 
um, and you need to try like some different sort of question types as well. Which mocks did I attempt? So um, when I applied for medicine, there wasn't that many online question banks, um, especially because decision making had like just been added. So what I did was I think I had a book um, of like a thousand UK cat questions. And I just worked through the whole book and then I used the mocks on the UCATS website. Um, they're really good. So um, I think I did them, but I, I know back then there wasn't that many. I think there are more now, but um, I know some people prefer um, saving them till right before their actual UCAT. Uh, more live seminars. Oh, so the live seminars, they won't be today, but I think there should be one next week, next Sunday at the same time. Um, if you've registered with um, six months, then you should get the links to those simply to today. Um, if you haven't, obviously, just go on their, their website and you'll be able to find it. Um, I can't remember what next week's is on, but um, some of them will be on UCAT. And through the summer, there'll be more um, UCAT ones. Should we only refer to practice questions? Or are there any books we should look for? Um, I personally recommend um, practice questions. I wouldn't necessarily like read up on like buy a book reading up on techniques or anything. If you're struggling with techniques, the UCAT website has um, kind of, I think they're like videos with recommendations about each, like the kind of background of each um, of the sections. So that might be good to like read or watch through. Um, they're obviously free as well on the UCAT website. Um, alternatively, come to the other six med surgeries or, or consider one of the other six med things um, because different tutors will have different advice and it might be that you know the more you might they might sort of suggest something that I haven't suggested that works for them and you might be like oh yeah that works more for me than the more I've suggested and um, everyone's a little bit different so yeah just ask other people what works for them and um, you can try those techniques too. I hope that was helpful. Um, there's no more questions in the chat, so if you do have one, please pop it in the chat. I don't mind answering about medical school in general as well, or even interviews, personal statements, etc. Um, but if you don't have any more questions, then feel free to go enjoy the rest of this lovely day. I'll just keep the chat box open for another um, couple of minutes, and if, if no one puts a question in there, I'll shut down the webinar. Anyway, what's the procedure for trying to get into emergency med? I assume you mean sort of the like postgraduate training kind of process. Um, so you obviously do um, medical school. And within your medical school, um, you probably have had a placement in emergency med. So I had one placement on an acute medical unit, one placement in A&A. &A. And um, that's sort of your like early exposure to emergency medicine. Then you can get um, a place in A&E. Um, everyone has to do some form of emergency medicine in their foundation program. So I'm doing acute medicine, but you can do a and &E if you're more interested in that, or you can do ICU if that's the kind of emergency medicine you're interested in. Um, so that's compulsory for everyone doing the foundation years, which everyone, if you want to stay on and train in the UK, everyone has to do those. Um, and then following that, I can't remember what the training process is at the moment, whether it's run through or whether it's just internal medicine, but there's basically um, another, it's probably, well, I'm trying to think how long it'll be, probably about six years. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it'll probably be around that. Um, of specialising within emergency medicine before you can be an emergency med consultant. Um, obviously, there's just like loads of different types of emergency medicine. So um, each one will have a slightly different training programme. 
Um, it is quite competitive from what I understand. Um, and obviously just being aware that emergency medicine for your whole career, you are pretty much doing nights and weekends as well and shift work. Um, it's not like a super cushy uh, specialty, um, but there's not really a whole lot you can do when you're at medical school, they'll do you like um, careers fairs where you can talk to your consultants from each of the different specialties and they'll be able to give you some advice on how to get into the pathway. Um, but you don't need to build your portfolio or anything until you start um, foundation year. Uh, also with emergency med, sorry, um, in the UK, there is an intercalation in, in emergency medicine. I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere down on the south coast. Um, so a lot of people who are really interested in emergency medicine do that intercalation, um, but you don't have to do it. It's just if that's like your interest. Can you give an overview on education of Queen Mary's? I don't know anyone at Queen Mary's actually, and I obviously went to Manchester, so um, I don't know that much about it. I would just go on their website and they'll have an overview of like their curriculum, what's important to them, what kind of thing they focus on. and, and that's probably the best best place. Uh, thank you so much. Really helpful. Um, how do you keep up with a mistake when the university acceptance rate is so low? Um, yeah, that's really difficult. Um, I think a lot of people now think that it's harder to get into medical school than it used to be. And it, when I applied, it was the same acceptance rate. So. Um, it just is really rough. And I think if you really want to do medicine, stick with it. A lot of people have to apply a couple of years running. I was very lucky to get in the first time I applied. Um, but just kind of focus on what the next step is. Don't try and get like too overwhelmed with, oh, I have to run a statement, I have to do UCAT, whatever. Think about what your next step is and focus on that and just make sure you like take each, each one off as you go. Um, and I promise you, no matter what happens, you'll get there in the end if, if it's what you really want to do. Um, I know loads of different people who took loads of different routes into medicine. Um, you'll be absolutely fine. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything under advice doing. Yeah, just remember that universities as well aren't just looking for like the smartest people. They're looking for people who are also nice people um, who are going to be good doctors in in all the different ways so don't worry too much if you're thinking you know oh like i'm not the smartest person in my school and um, there are other reasons why you'll make a great doctor one day and just focus on those as well um and yeah don't be too disheartened if, if you get rejected i don't i don't even know if i know anyone who got offers from all of their medical schools um i got three medical school offers and that scene is very good so um yeah just if you get rejected don't let it get you down too much. There might be a medical school out there who desperately wants to have you. So um, yeah, it's all very normal. And I promise you, there's not a doctor out there who hasn't failed an exam at some point in their life. So just like look after yourself, make sure you've got a good support network. Um, don't be too harsh on yourself and um, you'll get there, I promise. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, also, if you're worried about like, not being strong enough, just read through the universities you want to go to, read through their websites, see what in particular they're looking for. And um, then you can kind of like tailor your approach to what they want. So if they really care about patient focus, then in your interview, you can talk a lot about patient focus. Um, in the SATs, if the question asks about the appropriateness of the type of response, is it possible to have multiple very appropriate? Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, so if you think about like a real life scenario, um, then you might see something that goes very wrong. It might be absolutely appropriate in that moment to intervene, but it would also be appropriate then to report the incident afterwards. And it would also be very appropriate to discuss with the member of the team who was involved in the incident, um, what had happened like a debrief afterwards. So all of these things would be very appropriate in real life and the SJT will mirror that. So it's not that something will be the most appropriate. Um, quite often there will be, multiple things that are very appropriate and um just be aware that some things might like just be the not ideal approach so it might say something like I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head but if um something protects patient safety but then sort of undermines the colleague a bit similar to the question we did um that is appropriate because you have like 
helped that patient and that was like urgently needed but you've also undermined your colleagues so you've kind of it wouldn't be the most ideal thing to do that's the kind of reason why you'd put uh, an answer as being appropriate but not ideal um so yeah hopefully that helped will the webinar be posted somewhere so yes i don't know how quickly they post them um because I'm, I'm not really involved in that sort of side of it. Um, I think I was told they get posted on the Six Med YouTube, um, but I think there's also links on the Six Med website. If you can't find it, email the Six Med team and they will be able to like send you a link. Um, I would have thought, hopefully. And thank you for any of you who are still here who are saying thank you. Um, I'm glad it was helpful. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. There's no more in there at the moment. Also, um, Six Med have uh, some WhatsApp chats as well, where you can just ask advice. I'm in a couple of them, and I know some other tutors are as well. So if you're in any of those chats or want to be in any of those chats, then um, you can ask some more questions there and someone will get around to speaking to you. Um, where can we join? I assume you into the WhatsApp chats. I actually don't know. I'm assuming the link's somewhere on the web on the um, Six Med website. But again, uh, if you can't find it, then just email the team and ask how you join. I'm guessing there's a link somewhere. But that's also good. You can talk to um, other people who are applying and going through the same thing as you. Any more questions? Yeah, you have a great day as well, everybody. Okay, advise finding UCAT group studies, not in school, college at the moment. Um, so I, I, again, was very lucky. I had a few friends who were also applying to medicine at the same time as me, so we did it together. Um, I think Facebook should have a few um, UCAT groups, maybe not sort of in-person study groups, but I'm sure there'll be people online who would do like Teams meetings and go through questions um, together. Um, yeah, I would try Facebook and just sort of search UCAT study groups. Um, and like I said, um, SixMed, I think, have a WhatsApp. Well, I know they have WhatsApp. So even if you can get onto one of those WhatsApp chats and, and ask on there if anyone would like to do any group study online. You might be able to find someone. <coughs> Anyone else? There's only four of you guys left. If not, then feel free to leave so that I know when to um to end the end the chat and that you're not typing. Any two of you guys left? Do you, either of you have any questions? I give you a minute to type, and uh, if uh, in a minute's time you haven't typed anything, I'll end the webinar. I think that was about a minute. If you do have any more questions, obviously just drop six med um, a message um, or save it and come to another one of the webinars and you can ask it there. Have a lovely day, the rest of you.